there's a, a speaker we have coming, Rudy Salinas, who, um, who I am so blown away by. <laughs> um, and we're going to switch gears here and talk just a little bit about why there's homeless. And there's a lot of reasons. Um, so he mentioned, and Oliver mentioned a number of them. It has to do with the increased cost in housing. It has to do with the increased cost to build housing. It used to be just a few dollars per square foot. Now it's crazy. It's over hundred dollars. And it, so it's gone from like 1950 to $20 a square foot to over a over hundred to close to 200 square foot. It has to do with um, with the cost, the increased costs, the, the higher cost of housing, as well as we're losing affordable housing. So we were really good at building affordable housing in the early 70s. And then HUD has been cut in half and in half and a half since that time. So we, we just don't have an allocation of funding to do the affordable housing. So we have to look at other additional funding streams. That's why cities are looking at affordable housing trust funds and all different ways to tap local resources to build those trust funds. Um, and so it's the, co the, the money for affordable housing that's being cut dramatically. Um, there's a couple other factors. It's on a slide I'm going to show you as soon as uh, Rudy uh, starts uh, after he shares. But I wanted to mention some of this because it really enables us to see right now it's a very unique time in history where all of these things have converged. Um, there's, a, there's something I want to read about Rudy. Um, it's his, his uh, bio. You have to list here of all the bios. He's worked with people experiencing poverty and homelessness since 1998. And he's truly a trendsetter. He's leading in developing new strategic approaches to engaging people living on the streets. He's right now the Chief Program Officer for the Blessed Sacrament in Hollywood. And, um, and, and his experience in directing street outreach initiatives in Southern California have served a foundation of how policy has been shaped across our country. So we're really blessed to have uh, someone of his caliber to come and be with us today. Um, he's recognized broadly as being a highly valuable community partner able to respond to calls for assistance in connecting homeless individuals with the services they need in a compassionate manner. So his work has been highlighted in LA Times, Geograph National Geographic, um, on TV, CNN, and BCC. So um, I want to welcome Rudy. Please give him your hand. Hello, everybody. Hi. So first, allow me to apologize. I do not believe I printed enough for the whole crowd. I was not anticipating this many people here today. So I think if you do have one of uh, the two papers I've handed out, please do take a moment to share it amongst those folks sitting at your table. To give you a heads up of what these are, uh, these are both written by friends, by colleagues of mine that I've grown to trust. One is uh, Adam Murray, who is the executive director of Inner City Law, located in Skid Row, always working for the rights of the people experiencing homeless in Skid Row and the poor in that community. And the other one is by a dear friend that I miss very much, uh, the great Molly Lowry, who passed away two years ago, who uh, had written an editorial piece published in the Los Angeles Times about her 40 plus years of experience with all these efforts to address homelessness, all these 10 year plans that come up every few years, and just the absolute frustration of the mental health system, which I'll talk about a little bit. I've been doing this for over 15 years. I am from the San Gabriel Valley. I was born and raised by an immigrant family from South America here in Alhambra, very close to here. And I was raised a very, very strict Catholic. And I was put through uh, a lot of uh, different spaces in my life where I was able to be involved from childhood in communities that struggled, communities made up of immigrants, communities that basically uh, my parents put me uh, in front of as a child in order to understand the gift and the value of what I had at home growing up in a nuclear home with two parents, a sister, a dog, and all the other wonderful things that you get growing up in Southern California. About 15 years ago, I walked into this career by accident. 
I did not have a plan to work with people experiencing homelessness. I was planning to become a Spanish interpreter for the courts here in Los Angeles County. I could not afford school, tuition, and books, so I needed a job desperately. And one of uh, our shared mentors, uh, Dr. Joe Coletti from Fuller Seminary, invited me to work for his organization because they needed somebody who spoke Spanish to interview families living in El Monte that were experiencing homelessness. And I had no clue what I was doing. <laughs> I was interviewing people in the office, and right away he said, here's a van, here's a teammate, he's a teammate, go out to the field, and instead of waiting for folks to come in here, go find them in the places where they're sleeping on the streets. And for years, I basically was leading an outreach effort throughout the San Gabriel Valley, from El Monte to Pomona, from here in Monrovia all the way down to Whittier, looking for people unsheltered, looking for people living in places where humans should not sleep. Obviously, you see the definition of what chronic homelessness is, and this is key because within the way housing and urban development defines homelessness, chronic homelessness is not just a person who lost their apartment or their home you know, a day or two ago. This is a person who's been unsheltered for at least a 12-month period of time, or a person who's experienced four different episodes of homelessness within a three-year period of time. And this is key in my presentation because the people I'm going to be talking about today are the people that quite often we used to see a decade ago just on the very edge of the freeway when we would be going into downtown, but now they are the people that you see less than a few blocks from where you live. So I'm talking about the chronically homeless today. I started doing this work in El Monte. I basically led the first homeless count in the San Gabriel Valley when it was conducted about 10 years ago. And it was, as a result of my efforts, I was poached from Al Monte and taken to lead the outreach teams for the Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority. So I became the director of outreach for LASA and did so for many years. And that allowed me to go beyond my neighborhood. That allowed me to go to the very edge of Venice to see what homelessness looked like in Long Beach, to go into the valley, and to actually understand that in a, count, in a county of Los Angeles with 88 different cities, homelessness is not the same in every single community. I learned very quickly that if you go to the west side, if you're anywhere within the proximity of the Veterans Administration Hospital, chances are that the folks that are sleeping around that area happen to be veterans. I learned that even though I was running into veterans from Vietnam, less than a few years ago I started running into veterans from Iraq and from Afghanistan. And it is shocking to say that out loud, to consider that we don't learn from our mistakes and that we continue to see young people coming back to those places, experiencing almost the exact same thing that veterans did almost 30 years ago. So my efforts basically took me into the realm of going out into the streets and invite people to get in my van. So just think about this for a minute. <laughs> You're sitting in a bench and all of a sudden a van pulls up and two strangers wearing a uniform walk out and ask you, do you want to get inside the van? <laughs> We basically would go out with nothing more than maybe a lunch, maybe some socks, sometimes cigarettes, and our basic goal was easy. If the person gets in the van and I can take them to the shelter and they can sleep one night in the shelter, I am successful. And that was what I did for many, many years. I did so, and I did so in a setting where homeless services in LA had basically started to expand beyond the boundaries of Skid Row. And this is important to understand. Homelessness, as it relates to the city of Los Angeles, has always been contained to the boundaries of a 50-block area in Skid Row. Going back to 100 years, basically at the time of, let's just say, in the 20s, in the temperance movement, a lot of the missions that came up were all in that 50-square-block area. And services were basically contained there. So that if you were homeless, let's say, in another community elsewhere in the county, Chances are that a taxi or an ambulance or some well-doer would put you in their vehicle and drive you there because that's where homeless services were. And I am aware that there have been churches and communities elsewhere that have been doing this for a long time, but that was the epicenter of where people experiencing homelessness went. And with the passing of the decades, the population that was once a very white, 20 to 40 male, you know, laborer who would go there to work and to unload trucks and unload stuff in the garment district started to shift after the war. We sent people to Korea, we sent people to Vietnam to fight, and the people that we sent were minorities. The large majority of them 
were Latino and black. And as a result of this, the efforts in the community around Skid Row began to change significantly. And let me just say this about Skid Row, is that Skid Row at one point had 15,000 units of housing in it. But as a result of the changes that happened in downtown LA at the time that we started to tear down and build the Civic Center and build these beautiful buildings, Skid Row lost half of those 15,000 units. And as a result of that, Fifth Skid, all the people that had been in those units, that were, weren't necessarily hotels, but they were SROs, which were called single room occupancies, began to go out into the streets. And as the units of housing started to disappear in Skid Row, the population continued to grow. Because you see, communities kept sending people into these areas, seeking help and seeking assistance. I, I share the history of Skid Row with you briefly, and I know I've skipped a lot, because it's important to understand that when I started doing this, if I met a man who said, I want to go to a shelter, unless there was a winter shelter happening out here in the valley, and there was between December 1 and March 15th, the only places I could realistically take him to were in downtown LA. And I will never forget, people would come up to me and say, Rudy, I can't go to downtown LA. I just got off the drug I'm using, and if I stay in a shelter, I'm going to be very, very tempted to use it because I know the guy who sells it me is right across the street from the shelter. Mm -hmm. And that is very telling to me. So let me move a little bit because I know I'm behind on this. Uh, obviously, we've talked a lot this morning about the shortage of housing, and I think it cannot be said enough that it is key. But it's important to understand that there are also besides the shortage of housing. We have to understand, too, that in a city the size of Los Angeles that has historically always had problems, uh, there have been other things that cause or add to the number of homeless in the city. I think it's important to understand that we have a very broken foster care system. Yeah. That the care provided to young people up to the age of 18 does not prepare them for what will happen after 18 when they are released into the streets. Often with disease, often with some undiagnosed mental health condition, and always continuing to struggle because they have not found a pattern of stability during the time that they were young people. The reason I say this is from my experiences, I will tell you that I led counts everywhere around the county. I've been privileged to be brought in to help not just enumerate the population, but interview the population and understand the dynamics of every population in different parts of this county. One that stands out to me with foster care was that when we went into the city of West Hollywood, which is very small, it's less than 1.8 miles long, but it is one of the wealthiest cities in, this, in the county of Los Angeles. We found approximately 180 people in less than a two-mile area sleeping unsheltered on the streets of that community. And of those 180 people, nearly 90% of them, 90% of those 180 men, told me that they came out of foster care. And please understand that this is an indicator when you see that it's not just a shortage of housing, but the systems that exist are not able to maintain or hold or service populations appropriately. The other thing to consider here has to do with the fact that we have emergency rooms that are saturated with people who seek shelter when they're sick, with people who will feel a symptom, or persons who basically have really long, undiagnosed physical conditions that do require intense medical care. Let me say this if you haven't heard this before. The average life expectancy of the average American in the United States is 87. The average life expectancy of a chronic homeless American in the United States is 47. So we talk about emergency rooms all the way from Pomona to the beach that are often saturated in emergency rooms with social workers who are overburdened, who are basically being pushed and have no option and no, have no idea where to put folks. Because when we talk about shelter shortage, and I'll talk about that in a minute, the number is 60,000. The number you keep hearing is 58,000, right? When I did the first count, the first count many, many years ago, it was almost 90,000 people sleeping unsheltered in the county. And just take this into account for a minute. For those 90,000 people, there were at one point less than 14,000 shelter beds. So if every single homeless person on one single night decided that they wanted a shelter bed, of 60,000 or 80,000, depending on which count you go with, less than 14,000 of them would be able to get into a bed. And that's the system we were in. The way we've handled homelessness for decades has been providing soups, providing food, yeah. providing shelter. 
when you would go into the old system, if you were good in a shelter and you behaved and you managed to follow the rules, and let me show you the rules. Well, that's me. I'll get back to that in a minute. Uh, uh, when you get into the shelter, you must look for permanent housing. You must help with chores. You must follow the curfew. You must, believe it or not, pee in a cup sometimes to make sure that you're not using drugs. You basically had to follow a series of different rules that allowed you to have the possibility to stay in the shelter that night. And if you actually did all those things in an emergency shelter, you would graduate to a transitional shelter. And let me use this word really quick. Transitional is different than emergency. Emergency, based on HUD's guidelines, is 90 days. Transitional is anywhere from 18 months to two years. Transitional does not look as scary as a uh, regular shelter. Uh, emergency shelters basically look like this. You would have a large hangar with 400 beds. You would be sleeping next to each other. I once struggled for years with a veteran, convincing him, please come to the shelter. And he told me, no, I'm not exaggerating, at least 20 times. And on the one day it was raining that I got up to the top of the hill to interview the guy, he finally told me, can I explain to you, Rudy, why I don't want to go to the shelter? He said to me, I hear at least 14 different voices in my head. And when I'm up here on the hill and I hear those voices and I look around the hill, I know that I'm the only one here. And I know that those voices aren't around me. But when you put me in a setting where there's 300 other men and I hear those voices, I get in fights. I start getting people and I start hitting them. So I would rather sleep up here than I would in that setting. So let's just go back for a minute. Transitional shelter, 18 months to two years. Transitional shelter, you might get a job, you might get some benefits turned on, and once you do, you're able to get those benefits, save some money, and hopefully get into an apartment or get a job. This that I'm, that I'm explaining to you is the old continuum of shelter. Go back to the beginning of when I was talking. I would get a guy in a van and put him in a shelter. Honestly, less than 3% of the time, that person would actually follow the whole thing and eventually get into housing. Because the people who typically were getting into housing when I started my career were high functioning, were what you call low hanging fruit, were the ones who did not use drugs or had managed to get off of them and had medication to treat their psychosis. And basically, housing that was available when I started this career was intended for those who really didn't need it that badly. What's changed dramatically in Los Angeles, and this is why you hear H and HHH being thrown around, is the fact that we are now in a model which is called Housing First. About a decade ago, or well over a decade ago, an experiment took place in New York City where everyone, and you guys remember the old New York City before it turned into Disneyland, when it was kind of kind of scuzzy, right? So you had Times Square, basically outreach teams went out throughout Times Square and took 600 people who were sleeping unsheltered around Times Square and put them into 600 apartments that were prepared for them. So imagine an army of outreach workers like me went, met a person, handed them a key, walked them into an apartment in Times Square and put them in there. And for one year, all these outreach workers took these people to medical appointments, took them to buy their groceries, helped them with advocacy at the DMV or at Social Security for one year. The way the experiment works is after one year of working with the folks, everyone got pulled out. And all the folks, the 500 plus folks that were housed, were left to their own devices for one year. So imagine one year of intense services, and then we're going to do one year after the intense services and leave you alone. The city came back on the third year to see what happened to these folks after that one year, and realized that 88% of them were still housed. 88% of these folks were still in their housing. The 12% that fell out either fell out because they were incarcerated, because they passed away, or because they were so sick that they needed to be in a boarding care or a skilled nursing facility. And it was at that moment that the city of New York realized, wait a minute, we are bleeding money. We are paying for shelter decade after decade when it's actually cheaper to house this person and reduce our costs across the board. In my efforts in the city of West Hollywood, doing outreach, and I keep going back to West Hollywood because I was there for a while, we found eight men, eight men who were sleeping unsheltered on the streets and we did an extensive interview with these eight men to find out how many times they got arrested, 
How many times were they in the emergency room? And basically, these men were getting arrested once every three to four days because of public intoxication. On top of that, they were going to Cedar Sinai, which is the hospital where movie stars go to have babies and die. Right? And these eight men were costing the city of West Hollywood approximately $864,000 a year. Eight men. $864,000 for the ambulance driver, the paramedic, the officer, the nurse, the doctor. All of us. It was at that point that the city of West Hollywood, like New York City, woke up and said, absurd. It would be cheaper for us to literally pay their rent, pay you, Rudy, to take care of them in their apartment, than it would be for us to allow them to be outside. And this is where the shift to housing first becomes basically more national. Suddenly the continuum of services shifts to this idea or this notion that everyone can have direct access to a home that it does not require sobriety. It does not require medication. I, I don't tell a person, oh, but you gotta be sober before I give you your key. Because in a harm reduction model, I know that if I can keep this person housed, even if they're still using, with my trust and with the time I spend with them, the use will start to minimize itself to the point where it won't affect the life of the neighbors. And chances are, because I've seen it often, this person will eventually start treating themselves and start stabilizing. I work for the Center of Blessed Sacrament. I've been there for a month. And before there, I was at Housing Works for five years. And in the five years I was at Housing Works, we housed over 600 of the sickest, most chronically homeless persons in the county at a retention rate of 98%. At the end of the day, the Department of Health Services tells us that we, for every dollar they spent, we were saving them $1.20. So if you don't look at this from the humane manner, from the fact that every human living on Earth has the right, especially in the richest country on Earth, to live under a roof, look at it from your cost savings. Your officer, who is often being saturated or sent left and right to be the person addressing psycho psychotic people on the streets when he or she has not been trained to do that, is the one who suffers and ends up getting into situations that often are violent and can lead to some someone getting seriously hurt. I want to conclude my pieces about Housing First a little bit. Uh, housing First accepts that we basically have housing available to us. And this is where I'm going to go dark for a minute. We know the recipe and we know the blueprint for addressing this. We know that if at rates of 88 and 98% people are able to sustain themselves in housing, it's not fair to say when you see a person on the edge of the road, that person doesn't want housing. The problem is often that we have not approached that person in a way that's tailored to his or her needs to offer them the housing. It is important to understand that every single person I've encountered in my career is different. And that even though I may see some similarities in certain situations, everyone requires their design and their rule. The other thing to understand is that I do not make the rules and I do not guide them. They guide me. An old boss of mine once said, Rudy, the work you do is like a ballroom dance where you have both people gracefully going across the dance floor to the sound of the waltz. However, one of them is leading. And the one that's leading is the one that I'm serving. Because the services must be tailored to each person's needs when we do this. My frustration to you all today is that we do not have enough housing. Is that the vacancy rate right now in the county of Los Angeles for apartments that we have Section 8 certificates for is less than 2%. That in the last five years, at least a hundred of the people I got to serve had a Section 8 certificate given to them by the county so that they could go out and find an apartment. And at the end of the 90 plus days that they were given to find the apartment, they literally had to give the certificate back to the housing authority because they could not find one. And please consider that for a minute. The need for housing is so severe that we have folks that are now going to the very edges of the city. We have people who are going from places where they were born, raised, went to school, and worked to live in places like Lancaster and Palmdale. And when you take a person who is ill and put them in a community where they do not have connections, where they do not have a medical home, where they have no resources, just imagine rerouting yourself. I'll say this too, and I think this is important. The people I encountered in my efforts understanding the complexity of their needs and what happened to them, in all, every community, there was one thing I found in common. 
The people I would find sleeping under benches and under buses and under uh, bridges were typically from a six to eight mile radius from where I found them. And please consider that for a minute. They either went to school, worked, or had a family member who lived within a six to eight mile radius of where I was finding them. And the reason I really want to drive this home this morning or this afternoon is because you often hear this myth that they're not our homeless. That they're not ours. They came from somewhere else. The police pushed them over here. And please understand that from a person who's been doing this for 15 years, this is not true. You may have scattered situations that will say that, but chances are in the majority of the cases that you will see that this person had a reason to be there. And think of your own lives. If you lost your home today and you had no network and no family, why on earth would you leave the Sangiro Valley and move to another area? If you knew you had a friend or a family member nearby who might give you food or let you take a shower one day or give you a ride to the doctor. I'm going to finish because I think I'm in my last two minutes. I wanted to show you a photo of this house. This house uh, was lost during the foreclosure crisis in 2008 and went to the property of the Bank of America in the city of Los Angeles. And in 2008, the Department of Health Services leader basically told the county supervisors, give me that house. And the house was given to the head of DHS. The head of DHS then refurbished the house and basically put all modern amenities, all ADA settings inside so that people in wheelchairs could move around and navigate. And in that house, there lived two young men who are both undocumented from Guatemala in their early 20s, who have lived for the last 10 years at Rancho Los Amigos Recuperative Care in Bellflower and are both quadriplegic. Quadriplegic, undocumented men. The city put them both in there with four nurses who take care of them 24 hours a day. Change them, feed them, and take care of them in that house. They live in that house. We offered them the house. When they looked at us, they thought we were aliens. Like, what are you talking about? I don't live, I can only live in a hospital. They go to the theater, they go to the beach. One of them has a girlfriend. <laughs> they now live in a community. But the reason I share this with you is because I was often perplexed as to why there was such an urgency to put these two men in that house. Every day that they stayed at Rancho Los Amigos, which is a Department of Health Services operated facility, it was costing the county $5,000 a day. $5,000 a day in a hospital. What is being paid for now a day to keep them in that house is less than 600 bucks. And it includes the subsidy, the electricity, the gas, and the case services that our agency would provide and that the nurses would provide to keep them medically stable. Mm -hmm. The reason I say this to you is because it accepts that every, every single person has a right to a home. And we maintain relationships. And this is the other key I want to just chime on. Retention. Please do not believe for a minute that once a person has been housed, your job is over. I would argue that your job begins. You must now reintegrate this person into the community. You must now invite this person to your neighborhood and allow them to be part of your community. Otherwise, all these folks that we're housing will be back on the streets in a very short amount of time. And the next time you approach them to offer them housing, they won't believe you or trust you. Yeah. I went way past, but I want to say thank you to everybody and just say you guys are an amazing group. <laughs> I encounter people on the streets that I know are not intended for housing. 
I encounter people who I know need to be in a skilled nursing facility or a boarding care. I've also encountered people that I've housed, and within the first six months that I housed them, they passed away on me. What's really important to understand here is that this is not a simple problem. It will require reshaping the way we treat people in hospitals, the way we treat people in incarceration, the way we provide mental health services for folks. When a person says, I'm addicted to drugs and I want to go into a rehab now, they don't get into a rehab because it's very difficult to get into a rehab. So this problem is not just about building housing and taking care of people in apartments. It's about reforming and changing a lot of these broken systems that we've existed in for decades. Because you've heard it said all morning, the gap is going to continue to grow between the very wealthy and the poor. And you now all go back to your homes and sleep there tonight. But please realize that we are in that category that slowly, not our wages aren't increasing, our rents are getting higher, our neighborhoods are changing. And it's very significant to understand here that treatment has to be tailored specifically for each and every individual that we encounter. You were talking about Northeast, like Highland Park, Eagle Rock? Or? No, no, I got my Oregon. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I'm so LA centric that that's my world. But, uh, but yeah, no, I think it's very important to understand, though, that we must have multiple options rather than just housing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.